We move on to our second panel for the day, how startups want to engage. I would like to invite the moderator for this session, Mr. Naveen Raju, Executive Director of Time Mumbai to take the lead. Thank you, Julia. And uh, welcome everybody, good evening. Uh, this has been a great exercise for all of us and really in insightful talk from the previous panel, especially from the experts. Uh, and this is exactly what I think every startup in the country wants to listen and hear. On the format of this particular segment, uh, we are not going to be doing this as a panel discussion. Rather, we're going to be demonstrating five interesting startups that fit your bill, especially if you are a Nat Health member, if you are a hospital, clinic, diagnostician, or a pharma company. Here are five startups who have done some very interesting products. They are in either in early stage or growth stage. So like what most of you said, these are folks ready to actually grow with you. At Time Mumbai, we basically try and build this co-creation, commercial, and digital bridge between the industry and startups. Now, without further ado, let me first call the renal project, Shashank. Shashank, if you're ready, I think I'll give you seven minutes, Shashank, to present your, what I say, product and service and how you're basically working with uh, certain hospitals currently. Right, right. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Ty and Nathel for giving this uh, opportunity to uh, uh, present. Um, how is it going to be? Uh, do you want me to present or uh, the uh, someone from your team is going to do it? So Shashank, either way, if you want to present, you can present. I'll, I'll, yeah, I'll present. Can everybody uh, hear me okay and see my screen okay? We can hear you okay and see the screen as well. Perfect, perfect. Thank you. Thank you very much. So uh, we are the renal project and we are the chain of dialysis micro centers that India needs. And our vision is to revolutionize the availability of this life-sustaining therapy of uh, dialysis for kidney patients uh, across India with our unique micro center model. These are some of our facilities. We have around 21 facilities in the Mumbai, Pune, Thane, Nasik region already. And our team consists of myself. I am a biomedical engineer with 15 years of work experience uh, in medical devices. And uh, also uh, I'm an expert in uh, ISO 9001 and quality assurance. Uh, with me is uh, my co-founder, CTO, who is an expert in artificial intelligence and uh, uh, machine learning. He's from Anna University and is developing uh, a very interesting uh, platform of uh, dialysis management uh, called Vidur, uh, Mr. Vidur Mahajanji. Uh, and operations, uh, uh, we have Jitesh. Jitesh uh, comes from a very uh, humble background. He was a dialysis uh, uh, certified dialysis technician, but over 15 years and his uh, experience with Kokila Bain and other uh, brand names, he uh, has excelled in hospital management and dialysis care. So he handles my operations. So the problem is uh, that uh, there are numerous deaths uh, happening each year due to kidney failure related uh, diseases and two and a half lakh estimated new patients are added who need dialysis each year. And uh, most of them are unserved. And 90% uh, of the dialysis centers uh, are, uh, do not, uh, uh, you know, they, they do not go beyond the tier one or tier two uh, city limits. And so what India really needs is a dialysis facility that can penetrate into the corners of the country. The number one criteria which I saw uh, when I was researching this in 2018 and 19, that what is the number one factor for dropping out of, the, uh, of uh, dialysis or kidney care? Uh, and it was not the cost or affordability, but it was the proximity to actually get dialysis because this is a therapy that is a lifelong recurring therapy and is needed every three days, every three days. So, uh, and kidney transplant is a, is a very small fraction which can actually relieve them from getting this dialysis therapy. So, which makes it into a $3.1 billion industry and uh, globally it is going to grow now to more than 100 billion. Uh, however, this problem of having to go more than 100 kilometers, sometimes 150 kilometers every three days to go for dialysis therapy was such a big problem and is a, such a big problem in India. 
So we need to build a model that penetrates into this landscape of India, goes into the neighborhoods and the outskirts and the suburbs of tier one, two, and three city. And that is exactly what the renal project is. It's a chain of dialysis microcenters. And how do we do this? Uh, we uh, partner with those numerous 35 to 50 bed uh, hospitals who have 200 square feet of uh, place, water and electricity. And uh, these are sometimes uh, an orthopedic doctor having a nursing home uh, and does not uh, really, uh, uh, you know, it's, it's not his expertise uh, into nephrology or kidney care. Um, also, so dialysis has too many moving parts like the water quality, disinfection, preventive maintenance uh, of the machines, uh, which medical legal uh, and uh, which makes it very uh, convenient for them to just outsource it uh, to a partner like the, the renal project. So this, uh, the uh, 35 small bed nursing homes and the neighborhood hospitals, uh, which, uh, which lie on the outskirts of the city limits is uh, something that is untapped and there are a lot of patients that can be potentially uh, uh, benefit from uh, a kidney care facility over there. So this is uh, currently where we are. <clears throat> uh, we will soon be having 22 centers in the 18th month of inception. Our journey till date, we got incubated by the Niti Ayu government of the, gov uh, of the government uh, of India. And uh, I bootstrapped with uh, 25 lakhs in 2019. Uh, we got funding uh, from 100X, who saw that uh, our low-cost capex slide model uh, can recover very soon. And uh, just within uh, uh, four months, we had enough cash to build one more dialysis center. And then within uh, some uh, few weeks, we had uh, enough cash for another uh, a couple of centers. So they picked up on us. Uh, in August 2020, we raised another angel round. And... Uh, and now we will be looking into our next three series A and series A round of funding. So uh, uh, our journey so far has been 18 months, but we have very quickly become a, a very uh, well-rated uh, uh, dialysis provider facility. Uh, we have a lot of uh, very good uh, standard operating procedures and our patient care is, is uh, something that uh, someone, if you can visit one of our centers, we can showcase. And we are emerging as a trusted brand in kidney care in the community. So a differentiator from uh, other players is, uh, of course, the high penetration and the capex slide model uh, we have. A lot, a lot of the equipment we don't even purchase. We just lease it out. And as the center picks up, the lease is then uh, becoming a very uh, small amount for us to pay up. Uh, and the other one is Vidur. Vidur is our artificial intelligence and big data story. It stands for the virtual interface of the dialysis unit review. And uh, this, this uh, was something that, you know, as uh, Mr. Uh, Vidur Mahajan said that you need to have a problem and then build a solution towards it. So when we were growing and we were having multiple dialysis centers, we just realized that, uh, you know, it has to be centrally monitored. The stock maintenance, uh, the human resources, uh, the patient, uh, uh, you know, the dialysis uh, scheduling, uh, how the treatment is progressing uh, for each uh, patient. Everything has to be centrally monitored. Otherwise, we will not have any control towards it. Not just that, but also each patient, as soon as he uh, joins the renal project and then uh, throughout his lifetime, every three days is giving us immense amount of data, which cannot just lie over there. It needs to be organized and it has to be properly uh, digitized. So this, is this, uh, this was the inspiration that we had to have a backbone of software that can manage this entire data. Also, we, uh, as we progressed, we in, in count, uh, encountered more problems um, like uh, computer vision uh, was necessary, uh, telemedicine was necessary, and also Vidur gives an interface for the nephrologist and the data is actually uh, uh, put in to graphs and uh, scales so that it can be consumed very uh, very, very uh, conveniently by the nephrologist. Otherwise, the nephrologist so far in a lot of the centers, he's going all the way on the outskirts and is flipping all the uh, patient files. This cannot happen. If he can see the graph on his uh, computer screen with you know what are the pharmaceuticals given to him, what are the adverse events he's facing, he can remotely manage his patient without having to uh, go over there each and every time just for data. Right. So there was this definite problem in order to have this uh, a huge network of micro centers, we would need 
uh, an intelligent backbone of software and the technology uh, to make it happen. And that's why, where Vidur was born. 30 seconds left. Uh, okay. Yeah. Our outlook is that we will be growing uh, to 300 centers by 2023. We also have started home dialysis. Um, in the wake of COVID, it picked up very well. It now uh, accounts for more than 25% of our uh, revenues. And our strategic partners and the enablers, really, we, we need a lot of strategic partners. We, we want corporates to give us problems, right? We'll give us problems so that you know we know where in the solution can be and how can we partner with you guys. Uh, the, the fields in which we really need uh, strategic partnerships is pharmacy, pathology, facility and infrastructure, the technology, uh, you know, uh, especially on the software and the digital data side, uh, supply chain, equipment, awareness, spreading awareness and, you know, co-branding and also healthcare solutions. These are something that we um, really need help with uh, the partnerships and corporates have uh, have real problems. They have the experience with how things can go uh, wrong. And we want to pick up on their experience and um, design solutions and use our capability towards them. So that's about the renal project, all I had. Thank you, Shasha. And for any of the industry people who'd like to get in touch with Shasha, please do ping us on the chat. We will directly get you in touch with Shasham. Uh, the next startup is We Engage. I would like to call uh, Mr. Tapesh. This is a very interesting company, and for most of the hospitals that are there, this is going to be useful. This is going to this is a post discharge patient care and engagement platform. Tapesh, yes. Uh, thanks, thanks, Naveen. Uh, thanks, Netas, and Time Mumbai to give him this opportunity. Uh, I will be probably more talking about what exactly we are doing, not much on the you know, investment or finance side. Uh, a very brief about us. Uh, I am a uh, come from a technology background and my co-founder is from the clinical side. Uh, before starting, we engage, uh, I had an uh, earlier startup in radiology IT where I think I worked almost uh, uh, 15 years, worked with many of the hospitals in the country and also in uh, some of the markets like uh, Malaysia, especially Indonesia. Uh, we engage uh, is basically a problem which has been uh, um, uh, where we both found us faced it very closely. When someone in the family was not well and <clears throat> while recovering at uh, uh, yeah, at home, there was numerous challenges. Uh, so we formed ourselves in Singapore. We raised an uh, angel fund from uh, some of the very successful tech entrepreneurs. And our technology is uh, primarily on the natural language processing and uh, basically building the conversations. So what problem we are solving? I think this is something everyone will relate to it. Uh, uh, once you get discharged from the hospital, there is a lot of, uh, there is significant time that uh, the patients uh, recover at home. And this is where uh, there are multiple challenges can happen and there is not very active help from the hospital perspective. Uh, it is almost uh, very, very difficult to reach out to your surgeons who did a surgery on you or some senior doctor because they are quite busy with handling the you know, IT patients. Uh, many a times, this can lead to very unwanted outcomes, uh, like we may miss uh, some of the early warning signals and land into emergency. Many a times, people are very over anxious. Uh, specifically, you will find is the patient is not sharing the problems with the you know family member, thinking it may be a trouble. So there is a there is a lot of I would say it's a it's a complex thing what happens to the patient at home. Uh, uh, there are some uh, countries who track this data uh, uh, very closely, especially in UK and US, where they see a significant number of readmissions, which can potentially I'm not saying all of them, but potentially can be avoided. Uh, if there is some kind of uh, education connect with the hospital exist. Uh, just to give you some perspective of that is uh, 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 some of the you know therapies like uh, or some of the um, uh, scenarios like chemotherapy. It is it, it, it is a it's a very long uh, you know treatment cycle. It is uh, typically st uh, start from say six months. It can go up to one year. A patient have multiple sessions on chemotherapy. And every time, uh, you know, a chemo is given, uh, the body reacts in a very unpredictable fashion. So uh, problem is the patient doesn't understand. They try to manage it at home uh, while many of the things have been seen very closely. 
um, I think there is a lot of work happening in the report, remote patient monitoring in terms of devices. But what we are trying to work on is not the device. You know, there is a way to check SpO2 or temperature. But the idea is how to really, uh, you know, put up a, a clear psychology behind it that people are aware about that they have to do it. So how do we do it? Uh, so when we started working on this problem, we said it's not a device problem. It is more about building a connect. Can someone call a patient every day and say, hey, uh, you, you need to do this. Today is your exercise day, please don't miss it. Or uh, uh, I think you missed your exercise yesterday. You missed your medication yesterday. It is very important. So that's where we, we realized that uh, a patient needs a human to talk to them, you know, and understand their problems. Uh, the challenge is uh, there are really no resources from the hospital perspective. And that's where we are building the kind of, a, you can say, a virtual nurse, which can connect to the patients every day and understand them. Uh, if you look at our approaches, we are trying to be very, very human, uh, you know, close. It is not like, you know, filling a form or just asking few things. It is really building the conversation which they feel uh, are very relevant to them and very pointed to them. So there's a lot of, I would say, algorithm which run behind it to make it possible. Uh, what we found is uh, we have uh, started doing some early trials. We are relatively young. We just started eight months back. Uh, but we, we have started doing multiple, uh, some of the trials. Uh, uh, to a bit surprise to us, uh, I think WhatsApp is something people find it very, very convenient because as a patient, you are on the WhatsApp. So if you have some kind of, a, uh, you know, uh, conversation happening on the WhatsApp. So what we have built is like a virtual nurse talking to uh, you in a very natural way. We also have a mobile app, which, as I said, uh, we, we are still talking to the hospitals whether they like to integrate this whole uh, uh, Indian to their app. And more important, we support multiple languages. We started with English, but now we have Kannada, Hindi, we are doing some work on the Tamil. So multiple languages are planned. Overall, uh, it is about a very comprehensive health. It is not about just checking your temperature. It is about uh, the system can even understand your query. So if you ask uh, what, what the medicine should I take now? system will be able to answer it very accurately. So um, it's, 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 it's a view that we are just trying to create. The, it's just that you, you do not have a real human being, but someone who is closely looking at you. Uh, how it works in a hospital setup? Uh, 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 overall, uh, we, we, we plan to launch it from the hospital side, where hospital offer this uh, you know, kind of a help or continuum of care to their patients. So uh, there is a discharge summary. Uh, most of the information is in two, three page of world file. We take that discharge summary and we have a lot of algorithms uh, which actually understand the discharge summary and make a very personal, I would say a monitoring plan and talk to the patient every day. So that's how we do it. And whatever we are talking, it actually takes, it makes a data out of it and push it back to the hospital. So at the hospital side, they are able to see all the patients, how, how well they are doing. Uh, uh, this is, uh, I would say, I think as a startup, it's very important to, uh, you know, uh, uh, touch your customers. So we have started working with some of the hospitals. Uh, uh, we, especially on the cardiology front, we are seeing a lot of interest. So we are working with the, uh, a very large medical college. One of the hospital in Kerala de uh, deployed to manage their post-COVID uh, complications. So this, this, that is still running. Uh, we are working with a very large pharma uh, who liked our overall platform and they want to deploy it uh, in a pre-consult workup. And we have few deployments. Uh, I think outside India, we got certain good traction and we have already started deploying there. Uh, at the end, yes, uh, I think there has to be enough motivation for hospitals to look at it. So we see that eventually our overall vision is in the hospitals. Today, you know, do not have a so-called very focused post uh, you know, discharge care practices. So we want to really innovate into that so that as a hospital, whenever the patient is discharged, that's become a, a kind of a practice, uh, you know, standard practice. Uh, that's that's where we are uh, in, uh, uh, as a we engage. Thank you. Thank you, Tapesh. That was useful. So for folks who would like to get in touch with Tapesh, please do drop, a, drop in your questions and requests on the chat. We will kind of consolidate all of that and send it to them. Uh, we will, of course, take up questions after all the five startups have spoken. So, thank you. Uh, next I have is Mera Doc. Uh, Mr. Sudhir Mathur will be presenting it. 
uh, they do telemedicine access to a lot of homes. Uh, Mr. Mathur, are you there? I'm here. Can you see me or hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Okay, great. Over to you. Let me just uh, firstly thank you for uh, to TIE and Natel for inviting us, especially at its uh, inaugural session. Uh, it's been wonderful. I'm just putting up my presentation. You know, it's been very, very uh, deeply and in, in, uh, you know encouraging to hear everybody say, uh, you know, what they did. You know, for some strange reason, I'm not able to. Okay, okay. Here we go. Yes. And uh, you know, so I'd like to start by talking about trends that uh, we saw and why we wanted to get into this business. Followed by, you know, we have Dr. Uh, Vidur Marjan on our board. So as he mentioned, you know, we uh, talk. We, I will talk about the problem that we were trying to solve and what is Mera Dog going to do about it. I think a lot, lot, we felt that a lot had been happening on the entire healthcare side. But, um, you know, it was in bits and pieces across the world. India was playing a huge role in it, uh, you know, but it was in, in a lot of silos. And it's taken a devastating virus to, you know, and we believe this evolution is going to turn into a raging resident evolution. We heard, uh, you know, even Deepak talk about it, that uh, it's, it's just going to, you know, explode as people you know, become more and more aware about what. So you know, we clearly saw over the last couple of years that the government infrastructure and technology, you know, there, there is a fight for capital at the government level. And it's you know, clearly inadequate you know, to provide the care that is possibly required uh, to the entire society as a whole. Uh, there is COVID brought about a heightened awareness and access to healthcare, something we have never seen before. We believe it's going to be very, very explosive. And, uh, you know, philanthropic uh, and private capital, both, again, what something Deepak spoke about, is finding its way in very large quantums to help support, support this, uh, you know, sort of uh, you know, and, uh, change in, in uh, this thing. So, and, you know, I think, you know, what we saw, which was amazing uh, change in human behavior that a couple of panelists talked about, was change in consumer behavior or patient behavior, but you know, one size does fit, doesn't fit all. You know, everybody wants a unique, personalized, uh, you know, service that's available to them, and it was clearly not available. So, you know, moving ahead, you know, I mean, you know, I know Deepak spoke about a lot of lot, lots of trends uh, in in the space, uh, uh, a lot of numbers, but clearly, India is ready for the digital health revolution. You know, we've seen the size is going to be explosive. The penetration of, uh, you know, the digital footprint in India is huge. Our ability to consume data is huge. It might've been going into movies, et cetera, but the familiarity of using uh, data is just huge. So it, it eases the way. Yes, language can be a barrier, but there are ways to adopt that, to uh, change that through voice, et cetera. Uh, we expect the market. I mean, this is supported by a lot of research that, uh, you know, uh, that has been done in India to be explosive. And, uh, you know, each startup, I mean, this is the overall industry growth, but startups can have a much, much greater. We are seeing huge changes in the e-pharmacy, the teleconsultation, pathology, radiology, ev everywhere in this whole thing. So I'm going to skip over this. I think what we saw as issues, there are multiple aggregators with very different packages. There are no uniform healthcare packages, uh, unknown labs, uh, labs, uh, huge positive change. But as Dr. Manchanda also says, how do you, you know, work with this data that's coming all around? We saw change in pharmacy, multiple layers, you know, each pharmacy offering their own to start with, then creating into uh, fulfillment centers, Subscription models, uh, three days, four days to delivery, you know, which is fine for vitamins or something which you eat regularly. But if you want something right now, it's not available. Uh, highly discounted models. Now, I don't know whether that's really, we don't know whether that's really sustainable or not over a period of time. And in healthcare is slightly different than, you know, most of the e-commerce, you want to provide a sustainable cost model. Huge change in uh, artificial intelligence. I think everybody's spoken about it. So I'm going to skip this part. Numerous players offering uh, doctor consultations, scheduling appointments, but the connect with the patient, the follow through 
is missing. We just heard Tapesh talk about it. The follow through is was was really missing. So you know, just to look at what the issue in front of us is really that you know the while the system has undergone massive changes, they are still siloed, complex, and the patient is you know as it is discomforted, and to deal with multiple systems is uh, needs to be improved considerably. So we believe that you know the uh, from the doctor being at the centerpiece, just the doctor itself, there is a care team that is entirely required, and uh, you know with the patient as a centerpiece and a final decision maker how they want to do, do it. Uh, this we believe will certainly improve the outcomes for patients. The patient feedback is going to be critical, and just as in every business, a satisfied uh, customer will be a more engaged person to continue right through the life cycle of an episode or the entire life of wellness. So what is Miradoc all about? Uh, we are in the process of setting it up. Let me say that what we have at the moment is we built a great team of GPs uh, and we are engaging with some very, very senior GPs to have, have online. So what we really, it's a very GP centric model. And we are using our uh, AI to empower both the patient and the general physician to really improve the clinical outcomes, uh, reduce, reducing the patient burden, who have to deal with different you know, sub-ecosystems, ease, ease in decision making, go to just one system, which is a general, revive the old GP practice, which is a family doctor. And we believe, as Dr. Marjan also talked about, there was, I mean, there is infrastructure in the country, but it is not... It, even in a, uh, in a crisis, it could not be optimally utilized. So optimal utilization will definitely bend the cost curve uh, for everybody and improve profitability in, in, in the value change. So, you know, coming back to, you know, uh, so we want the GP to be the front at the patient's care team and navigate the whole system. I mean, certainly it will provide access to, uh, you know, uh, clearly the uh, specialists, to the medical facilities, I'll, I'll come to that. So what we believe is, uh, is the life cycle health manager, that's what we want to be providing. Uh, somebody who can be called up at any time of the day or night, uh, maybe not the same doctor 24 hours, but the system will be the GP, uh, the EHR management systems, uh, which integrate pathology, radiology, whatever it is, in to be able to uh, provide that and a, a suitable treatment plan and a follow-through plan. So integration of these clinical subsistence is going to be at the core uh, and empowering the uh, GP to take uh, you know, decisions along with the specialists whenever required. So you know, I've given an example, you could consult you know, a cardiologist at, in one hotel, follow through with another one. If that's what you really want to do for a double opinion, uh, or, or to different hospitals if you want different opinions, but come back to the GP and take their decision making. So this is how our model is going to be, uh, you know, working at. Uh, so our, our, our doctors are going to be in-house, our GPs are going to be in-house, guided by very advanced AI tools, which will help integrate the entire, uh, you know, data that's available or created uh, with, with the patient over the life cycle and we would provide every service integrated. I mean, this is an aggregated model. We would not be doing this on our own, but you know, the key is to, as in a forum like this, to find partners uh, who would provide uh, you know, us this on a very, very sustainable uh, commercial model, which is going to be a commercial model as well as value systems that is transparent across the board from the patient right down to, uh, you know, the, to, to our partners. Mr. Mathur, yeah. just 30 seconds left. Yeah, sure. I'm just going to skip to the last slide. And uh, the screen is not moving. But, okay, so I'm going to conclude with that to say, you know, back to, uh, you know, what are, this thing is a GP centric model and a patient centric model, but providing access to everybody seamlessly uh, across the board, not just to the individual, but to the family. We believe that the DNA of an individual, the family, as well as you know, community around disease spread or, or illness is spread on, on account of either DNA or where a person lives and to combine the two through artificial intelligence and improve decision making. 
So thanks a lot for that. So we, we will be, you know, thanks a lot, TI. We would be reaching out. And I hope some of the people who are listening on this reach out to us uh, to be able to make this, uh, you know, a sustainable model for society. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mathur. Uh, so folks, if you have any questions for uh, Mr. Mathur, please do put them on the chat. And I'm requesting all the startups to also start answering because I think we're going to be stretching the time. Uh, next we have is Cancer RX. Uh, Manisha is there and she's going to be presenting her startup. This is a platform that provides uh, DSS for oncology. So Manisha, over to you. Yeah, thank you, Naveen. Hi, everyone. Am I audible? Is my screen moving? Just doing a few checks. Yeah, you're audible. The screen is stagnant at the moment. Okay, all right. Does it move now, Naveen? No. No? No, no. Sorry, is it moving now? No. Uh, can Tripti take over? Yeah. Sure, we... just give me a second. So Manisha, stop sharing yeah, your screen. Yeah, sure. I'll do that. Is it visible? Yeah. Okay. Oh, sorry. Just give me a second. Manisha, in the meantime, you can start introducing yourself. Okay, all right. So uh, I run CancerX. At CancerX, we are working on clinical decision support for oncology, essentially solving challenges in cancer care using technology one by one. Uh, we are an AI ML deep learning model, and we help uh, clinicians make better, more judicious treatment decisions. An analogous example would be Google Maps for oncology. Uh, for example, a Google map tells you to go treatment path A, uh, path, a path B, path C from, uh, for example, uh, from place A to place B. But uh, you know, similarly, our algorithms help clinicians, oncologists with treatment paths A, B, C based on patient and disease profile. So that's where we are. Apologies for the glitch. Uh, Tripti, can you move on to the next one, please? Uh, so, uh, so our mission is to help patients at the grassroots level with access to best practices in cancer care. And we want to improve prognosis and outcomes in a sector which is generally besieged with suboptimal outcomes. Uh, the next one, Tripti. Yeah. No, the, the previous one, please. The one after this. Yeah. So what do we do? Uh, we are building a bunch of algorithms which help care providers with clinical intelligence, shorten the lead time from diagnosis to treatment. Our algorithms are cloud-based uh, with super fast turnaround time of just a few seconds. We help digitize care provider workflows, help doctors with real-time intelligence. Our, our software is enterprise grade, uh, which helps physicians make the right decisions at the right time. So essentially what we're doing is we're helping care providers get work done, transforming how work gets done at the provider level. The next one, Tripti. So we're tackling, trying to, trying to tackle some of the toughest challenges in uh, healthcare. First is a super low patient, doctor to patient ratio. Clinicians are burnt out. Uh, the number of oncologists to the number of patients is really, really low. There's high workload, treatment delays. Even when doctors want to do justice, they're not able to do that. Uh, the, this problem has been compounded by the disruption that we faced because of COVID. Uh, so COVID has disrupted the entire spectrum from diagnosis to ongoing care. Hospitals really haven't been equipped uh, you know, to offer an online experience, essentially because it was so sudden. Uh, the patient attrition rate is very, very high. Uh, in a place like Gurgaon, where I live, a, hospital would go to, a patient would go to one hospital and probably visit the seven, eight, nine peripheral hospitals. So what is the impact? Revenues at the hospital level. Hospitals typically find new patient acquisition a challenge. Uh, there are outreach camps, OPDs, patient sourcing camps that are conducted, uh, but how much of that, how much of the revenue comes in from there, nobody knows. Being a CAPEX heavy business, hospitals are under tremendous financial stress. Uh, the next one, Tripti. So our solutions are for clinics, hospitals, care providers. The first solution that we have 
is summarized. Summarize, as the name suggests, is summarization of key parameters based on the patient and disease profile. Now, what a summarize does is, you know, if you go to a hospital, in a typical cancer consultation, you would have a 45 to 50 minute consult in which either a junior doctor or the senior doctor himself will be sitting and jotting down parameters. So that takes about typically 20 to 25 minutes. Now, with summarize, we are able to give you a concise summary in just about a few seconds. You get a summary which is uh, which you get in about a few seconds. You can review that over five minutes, ten minutes. So what happens is that the consultation time gets shortened from a forty-five to fifty minutes to maybe a 10, 15 minutes, allowing you to see more patients in that time. The second product that we have is CDS, uh, as the name suggests, clinical decision support that suggests treatment paths uh, based on the patient and the disease profile. The next one, Tripti. So how the algorithm works is that you know you can upload the reports, the, uh, algor the algorithm will read the reports, clinical decision support will suggest treatment protocols. These can be reviewed uh, by the doctors as an option of adding uh, clinical notes, making modifications. And then these can be further shared ahead with either patients or caregivers, or you know, referring peers from peripheral centers. And there's an option of uh, you know, care continuum within the facility itself. The next one, Tripti. So, you know, as we worked across, we realized that, you know, at the grassroots levels, the EMR facility is not there. And even if it is there, uh, doctors do not know how to use it or hospitals themselves are not able to use it. So the process flow is very simple. Uh, the doctor can sign in, register using his email ID. The patient also gets a unique identification number based on his profile. You upload reports. You have an option of either choosing summarize or CDS or summarize plus CDS. Now, based on what you choose, you get an output. You can review that. And for returning patients, you get the treatment history. The next one, Tripti. So this is what some of our protocols look like. This is for breast cancer. One is for triple negative and one is for an advanced breast cancer. The next one, Tripti. So what we're trying to do is, you know, beyond digitizing workflows, we're also trying to help care providers reorganize care administration during the current pandemic and endemic times. So diagnosis, if the patient reports get uploaded, which the patient themselves can upload on a private URL, the doctors get a concise summary and are able to advise treatment options online. So what this means is that patients really don't need to visit hospitals, increasing exposure to themselves and also for the hospital staff, doctors, nursing. So most patients, you know, uh, who come to visit hospitals for cancer care, especially, are the ones who need supportive care. They really don't need care administration. So we have a repository of supposed, uh, you know, supportive care protocols. Now, based on the disease and the patient profile, you can advise, suggest supportive care protocols online. So this also helps with OPD management. So what happens is that instead of every patient walking into a doctor's clinic waiting two hours, you know, waiting outside for two hours, what this does is that only patients who need chemotherapy or immunotherapy administration come to the hospital. It reduces in-person visits, reduces time waiting for patients to wait outside the doctor's clinic, and reduces the in-person consultation time with the doctor that you spend with the doctor itself. Uh, then, you know, peer-to-peer -peer, uh, case discussions happen. You know, you could have peripheral centers. Uh, peripheral center doctors can sort of refer to you, you know, they help you with better diagnosis. And there is remote collaboration opportunities that sort of uh, happen. Then you have, you know, clinical trials. Clinicians can also advise clinical trials online. Most importantly, what a solution does is help with standardization. Standardization across a corporate chain. Now there are SCGs and there are money piles and there are portices and there are max, but every doctor is, you know, dancing to his own rhythm, singing to his own tune. Is there really standardization of care protocols even within facilities? Probably no. So what we do is, you know, we give the hospitals an API structure, which we give the hospitals a skeleton structure. They can use the structure and at least standardize care facilities within their own institutions. The other use case that it helps with is, you know, peripheral centers. For example, you have a name that you've got peripheral centers, or you are a facility in Gurgaon and you've got peripheral centers in Gurgaon, Rebadi, you know, nearby areas. You can actually standardize the entire care protocol spectrum through the peripheral centers. Uh, the next one, Tripti. So this is our product profile. We are 369 times faster. Uh, we did a pilot. And the pilot showed us that, you know, uh, the piloting hospital is a 100 bed hospital and, you know, they had a 69% increase in patient retention, 32% increase in revenues. We also have, you know, update clinical guidelines often so that doctors who are overburdened and not able to keep up 
uh, you know, the pace at which technology is changing and new molecules are coming in, are you able to keep up with that? Uh, integ integration is simple. You don't need any high-tech uh, technology upgrades. You're just able to start working using your email ID, mobile number. And in case APIs are required, we are there. So what we do is essentially connect the ecosystem, offer remote care collaboration opportunities, virtual easy access, a B2B grid to corporate hospitals so that the peripheral centers benefit by the best care and hospitals also benefit by way of uh, inflow of patients. We are available 24 by seven, no breaks in between. The next one, Prapti. So the value proposition, as I said earlier, uh, you know, extends across the spectrum. So for patients, it's data-backed expert opinions, best practices. For doctors, it's easy e-prescription, which reduces, uh, you know, load on them, improves their efficiency, productivity by 50%, addresses and solves the patient, the problem of a super low patient to doctor ratio, helps institutes bring in transparency, reliability, helps with better clinical outcomes, not just for patients, but also for doctors as well as institutes, helps with clinical governance. The next one, Tripti. Anisha, 30 seconds left. Yeah, sure. So as we deploy, I think we should be able to impact at least 75% of reported incidents in India. The next one, Tripti. So the ask is, uh, you know, opportunities for deployment. Can we deploy ourselves with Ayushman Bharat for a low-cost data-driven program? Can we deploy ourselves with AIMS, district hospitals, state hospitals, some of the private sector hospitals who are a part of uh, Nat Health? So thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Nat Health, uh, Tai, for giving us the opportunity to present. Uh, we look forward to hearing from uh, stakeholders. Thank, thank you, Manisha. Thanks. And also, you've got a couple of questions which people have pinned you on the. Sure, I'll take a look at that. To start this one. Yeah. We are going to stretch time, so I think you can start interacting with your fellow audience. I'll do that. Thank okay. you so much, Naveen, once again. Thank you. So, the last startup we have is Binox. And could I request Dr. Gul to come and share his vision and views? No pun intended. Thank you. Thank you, Naveen. Thank you, Ty, and uh, thank you, uh, Nat Health, for giving me this opportunity uh, to present uh, my uh, program today on Binox. I just want to make sure that my screen is available. It is, Doctor. All right. I probably am the uh, only medico in this August gathering, and uh, so my talk is going to be a little more medical than uh, technical or financial. But I'll try and my best to uh, make this medical uh, subject as simple as possible. Uh, what I have here is uh, a Binox, which is a cloud-based software, uh, which is uh, used for managing computer vision syndrome and uh, amblyopia. As we go ahead, uh, I will be talking more about what this means. Just to start with a short video. <laughs> So as we note, uh, in these pandemic times, uh, the whole culture of, uh, of living has changed. And we have new norms like work from home, uh, virtual classrooms for children, virtual meetings like what we're having today, and uh, everything has become digital. More and more of us are uh, uh, all the time in front of a computer screen or mobile phones. And what is the main concern that bothers people about uh, working so long on computers or mobile phones? is nothing but the eyesight and the vision. We ophthalmologists across the globe are getting frequent calls from panicked parents, from people you know, having uh, to ask questions about, uh, will this work on computers for hours, seven hours, eight hours? Will it any way affect my eyes? Well, I just try to simplify this. Uh, the computer work does cause some effect on the eyes and this is called as computer vision syndrome. Computer vision syndrome is a gamut of symptoms that one can have while working long hours on computers. Somebody can be suffering from eye strain, itchy eyes, headaches, blurred vision, or double vision. To put some figures in perspective, we have around 56 million people in India who use uh, computers on a regular basis. Uh, the figures are much higher, maybe around 500 million when you uh, encounter or when you count uh, all digital uh, 
media like uh, laptops uh, or uh, mobile phones. And the statistics say that 70 to 80% of people who work for more than three to four hours in front of a computer screen are likely to suffer from a computer vision syndrome. And what do we as clinicians do when we get patients uh, who come to us with these kind of symptoms? And you know, most of us uh, give them some moisturizing eye drops. We give them some uh, prescription glasses, ask them to have some anti-glare coating, make some postural arrangements, and uh, maybe you know, the new trend is to give some blue filter glasses. But do these actually work? Well, these methods provide some relief, but they really do not address the root cause. To put things into perspective, our eyes actually work like an autofocus camera. And this focusing of the eyes is done by the lens of the eye. The lens is controlled by muscles within the eyes. These muscles actually have to work a lot because there is a constant focusing and defocusing. And this constant focusing, defocusing causes a asthenopia or a eye strain on the eyes because of the sheer fatigue of these muscles. And nowhere in the world can any medicine or anything else can do it to strengthen these muscles. There's only one formula for that, and that is exercise. And we at Binox have a product which actually uh, takes care of the exercise program. I will be talking about it as we go ahead, uh, but let me also talk about the second product that we have in Binox, and that's about the treatment of amblyopia or lazy eye. Again, it's a very uh, medical terminology, but just to make it very simple, amblyopia or lazy eye is a condition where the eye functionally or organically looks very good and absolutely normal, but the brain is not able to interpret the image coming from the eye. Uh, it affects around uh, 2 to 4% of the population. And the world amblyopia market is, uh, is valued at around $4 billion. Again, the traditional method of uh, treating amblyopia has been something called as penalization, where we as uh, doctors, uh, we actually cover the better eye. The idea behind that being that once the better eye is covered, the brain actually uh, is forced to see with the lazy eye. And that's how the vision improves. But this treatment is far from perfect. Most children, I mean, the, the disease actually starts from childhood. And this starts uh, uh, to get a very negative impact on children who have to wear these uh, patches to go to school. They don't just hate it. Most of them leave it halfway. And many a times we have seen that once we stop this patching, the, the disease actually comes back. And anybody above the age of nine, this treatment is absolutely uh, futile and we do, we do not uh, advocate this treatment. In other words, anybody above the age of nine coming to us with lazy eye, we offer no solution for that person. Besides that, the treatment is long drawn. Uh, the patching protocol involves six hours of patching every day for close to around one or two years. What we have in Binox is a program of uh, Ambligo, where uh, this is a, again a soft, like we said, as a, a cloud-based software program based on the principle of dichoptic therapy. Here, what we have done, we have, we have made games, games which are very engaging, games which are very interesting to play. The child or the, even the adults, what they do is they just wear some uh, special glasses, sit in front of the computer screen and play these games with both their eyes open. So it is a binocular uh, treatment. The treatment is revolutionary in a way that it gives excellent results in about six weeks as compared to two years of patching. We've done uh, around uh, a thousand patients of uh, amblyopia treatment, and we've got around more than 90% success rate. And like I said, that this is how it works, uh, in, even in adults. The, the way we work in Binox, uh, both for CVS and for uh, lazy eye, is that we, we, we want a clinical examination to be done by the doctor, by maybe an ophthalmologist or an optometrist. And once the diagnosis is done, the right patient is selected. The patient is enrolled for the Binox program. Patient connects on our central helpline number. And once the patient connects, we explain to the patient what is to be done. And the whole session, whole treatment is done remotely uh, on a Zoom, on a platform like Zoom or uh, Microsoft Team. The entire uh, th 20, 10 sessions are required for a treatment of uh, CVS, computer vision syndrome and around 30 sessions are required for the treatment of amblyopia. 
Uh, all the treatment sessions are done totally on a remote setting. We've done treatment uh, for patients across the globe sitting right here in Mumbai. We've treated patients as far as Latin America. And once we are, uh, we are satisfied with the level of treatment that we've achieved or the goal that we've achieved, we send the patient back to the doctor for a reassessment and for their uh, inputs on this. 30 seconds, doctor. So this is one of its kind software for comprehensive management. It is hardware agnostic. Only thing that you require the computer and internet connectivity is very easy to use. And we do it ourselves. We've got some uh, uh, good awards in the international forum. We got the second prize at the American Society of Cataract and Refractive Surgery. And we uh, were a winner at the NASCOM last year. Uh, we have a global presence. We have around 475 centers in the world. You are using Binox. More than 4,000 patients have already been treated. Uh, this is our structure. We have, a, a, this is my team of founders, which is a mix of clinicians and uh, tech entrepreneurs, our international business partners, and a very highly luminary uh, medical advisory board consisting of the, the best and the biggest ophthalmologists across the world. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, doctor. That was really useful. So folks, in the interest of time, I don't think I'll be able to do a Q&A, but however, please do send us your questions. Uh, I would request all the five startups to come on the screen and please do type in your contact addresses in the chat and Q&A section so that people can directly get in touch with you all. And having said that, I'd like to thank NatHealth and IQA for making this happen. Uh, we as Thai would work diligently in trying to curate startups and provide the healthcare industry all the problem statements answers. And I think we look forward to the long association with NatHealth and, and you know, truly, truly accelerating the Indian healthcare industry. Having said that, thank you all.